Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Melissa Graham, and I work for Movement Observatory Data Management Team at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I'm also the chair of the Science Organizing Committee for this year's Project and Community Workshop. Um, welcome to plenary number four, which is a science keynote by Dr. Brian Nord, um, titled From Disruption Opportunity, the Current and Future Impact of AI on Astronomy. We're going to get to that um, right after we do morning announcements. So I have some announcements and also some reminders for you. The first reminder is that all sessions are recorded and posted on the respective web pages in the PCW website. Um, also remember that the Zoom prep room is staffed at 1.30 p.m. Pacific every day and you can find the link to that prep room on the PCW web page that's titled Attendee Guidelines. This is a Zoom webinar, so as you probably already noticed, attendees are muted, so please use the Q&A or the Slack channel for this plenary to ask your questions. Um, another reminder about Slack is that we do post announcements in the general channel, and if you have any questions or need help with anything technical or anything about the website, um, post it in the help channel, please. Uh, Ryan, reminder to all the session chairs that Friday at 12 p.m., the um, 12 p.m. Pacific, the breakout summary session requires all session chairs to make a one slide presentation about um, what happened in their session. And a reminder as well that tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific, instead of a plenary, there is a breakout on justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, and inclusion and has some preparatory actions to enhance your participation. And that's the video that was playing um, when you first joined was telling you about some of those actions that you can take. And just want to emphasize, and the session chairs want to emphasize that you don't have time to do that preparatory, um, view the pre preparatory material is totally fine. Please still come participate in the session. Uh, when you arrive in the main Zoom room for that session, you'll be given instructions as to what's going to happen. So please come anyway. Another reminder that when you registered for this meeting, you did sign a code of conduct. You can find it in the PCW website by going to resources, and it's the first on the list there. Um, and if you do witness or experience any violations of the code of conduct, there are um, designated contact people who, um, who you can get in touch with and tell them about what happened and work towards a resolution. And finally, just a, a final set of reminders about how to interact in the virtual world. Um, all talks, also this one and also for the rest of the day, are recorded. And if you don't want to be recorded, you can just turn your video off. That's totally fine. Um, in the Slack, when people ask questions and you like that question, please give it a thumbs up or some kind of other positive emoji to upvote it. And questions that get a lot of upvotes um, will be the ones that are spoken out loud and asked. But then, of course, all questions um, that come through Slack, if they don't, if they're not answered by the end of the session, we try to answer them later. So um, continue to participate in the Slack channels throughout the week. And that, that about covers it. So now for this morning's plenary, I'd like to invite Federica Bianco to unmute and share video. And also for our speaker, Brian Nord, to share video. And Fed is going to introduce Brian and then he will give the uh, plenary presentation. Hello, um, I think you need to stop sharing videos if you want my video to yep. hear. Hello, how's everybody? So I am truly honored and excited to introduce Dr. Brian Nord, who's a colleague and a friend and someone who I admire as a scientist and as a person. Brian's work focuses on how to improve the way in which we make scientific discoveries from developing algorithms, designing experiments, and re-envisioning research communities. Brian started his career on large-scale structure simulations. He has since studied galaxy clusters, strong gravitational lensing, and the cosmic microwave background. More recently, he has explored the potential of artificial intelligence, or AI, to address critical challenges in cosmological data analysis. And currently, he is integrating AI with rigorous statistical methods to aid the precise design of scientific experiments. Brian is a leader in the movement to address inequities and oppression in academic and research environments, working to drive anti-racist efforts and develop justice-oriented communities. In June of this year, 
he co-created the academic Strike for Black Lives that involved the scientific community worldwide directly in the current conversation about social justice and racism. He co-funded the Deep Skies community, which is dedicated to share leadership and prioritizing humanity of research colleagues over productivity. It's one of the first of its kind, and I'm proud to participate in it. He is the co-author of This is Black Light, a curriculum for learning about the Black experience. As a researcher at the Fermilab AI Project Office and Cosmic, Par and Cosmic, Par and Cosmic Physics Center, he provides strategic vision to the lab with respect to AI research investment. And he has a joint appointment at the University of Chicago where he also conducts AI research and anti-racist community building, as well as mentoring students. Many of his students presented their work at the interface of AI and astrophysics at earlier PCW meetings. And if you were in Tucson last year, you will remember several impressive posters presented by students in his team. So here's Brian Nord, our keynote speaker, presenting from Disruption, Opportunity, the current and future impact of AI in astronomy. Hi, thanks Federica and thanks, um, thanks to the entire community for having me here. It's, a, it's quite an honor um, and thanks for Melissa for helping make all of this possible. Um, I hope that today is a uh, productive, uh, useful, um, really interesting conversation for us and I hope that it helps us think about how we work with each other and how we create a new future for science, um, maybe how we reimagine what that will look like. So punctuations in human history that are driven by disruptive technologies, I think, present opportunities for us to decide not only how we want to interact with and investigate the natural world, but who we want to be. Um, the emergence of these new powers and abilities that we often see sometimes before we've had the time to consider their broad and long term implications, uh, they pose challenges we face as you know, not just as individuals, but as a community and as a species. Um, we've been faced with these choices throughout, uh, you know, our entire history as a, um, as a people. So this is not a talk about uh, artificial generalized intelligence, um, you know, also known as our future robot overlords. Uh, but there is something to be said about how humans will interact with AI driven humanoids. Um, and I think there's an interesting conversation to have there about that and that, with, uh, you know, at the intersection of that with sort of the mores and habits of, uh, of enslavement that we've seen um, across the planet. And that's, that's another conversation, but I think it's also one that we'll have to have as, uh, as a scientific community at some point, um, as some people are already having it. But I, so I, like I said, I'd like this to be a conversation about the choices we make, both implicit and explicit, um, in the adoption, development, implementation, implementation of new technologies. And I'm thinking about this, like in, you know, in the race to discover, to achieve, um, to figure things out, how often and how deeply do we actually ask, why am I doing this? Or who does this impact? And even should I pursue this? I think these answers are answers, getting answers to this is going to be challenging. And this is something that we have to do together. And I think it also leads to another question, which is who gets to decide what knowledge we pursue and which tools we develop? So who gets to be in the room where it happens when these decisions are made? And I think actually the evidence bears out that currently, you know, that, that the answer to that question is already clear and we'll get to that soon. Um, and so I think, you know, this is actually, in some ways this is more of a question about, you know, looking at us um, than it is about the science in some ways. So before we, you know, before I jump into what I see as the history of artificial intelligence, uh, so I, I think that would be good for us to go over to maybe predict the future a little bit. Um, I thought maybe it'd be fun for us to get on, sort of get on the same page um, in, in a way about where robots and AI is. So I, you know, I would say that AI is sort of everywhere. Um, it's, it's telling us what to watch. Uh, this is not my Netflix queue. This is, uh, this mine is much, probably much nerdier with spies and, uh, and, and hardcore sci-fi, um, but it's telling us what to watch, so consume. Um, it's helping us, helping us figure out what to buy. Uh, and in some cases, you can see there the, the Alexa uh, box. It's it's surveilling us uh, of our own accord. Um, 
it can sometimes say what is inside us by helping us uh, helping detect things that are going on inside our bodies. It is delivering things cross country um, and affecting jobs along the way. It has also changed how we think about language and how we translate language. It used to be that you would go from say German to English to Spanish uh, and that there would be some, some, some language in the middle that was the objective, uh, the objective one. And now um, machines read in information and codify it, uh, codify and quantify it all together. And then there is this large bag of words or this corpus from which another language is translated into. So that's changed dramatically. Um, it also maybe can do another thing that is sometimes considered distinctly human, which is to create art. Um, but this is where I wanted to do a quick poll. So um, uh, could we throw some poll numbers in there? Yeah, which one of these was made by an AI, A or B? I'm interested to see your votes. Both, nice, okay. Oh, it's neck and neck. Bees are slightly ahead. We'll let this, this is, this is actually pretty cool to watch. So we'll let the, oh, somebody thinks it is both. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. So we'll, yeah, I see that. We'll let this go for a little bit longer. If you're, if you want to vote, there's a, there are some red buttons to push uh, in, in uh, Ron Paul, Ron Paul's uh, little message there at the top. If you want to be part of the vote. No one has said neither yet. Interesting. All right, we'll keep going here. So it actually. Uh, it is A, um, and if you do any, um, <laughs> uh, and if you um, if you do any Photoshop and use cont content aware features, you might notice the the tree in the middle there in A. There are kind of some things that were thrown around, um, and so this is not only is this an interesting example of thinking about how how AI, which we haven't defined yet, has been progressing. Um, it also maybe can give you some, some footing to predict issues that you might see for this in science. Going a little bit further down the rabbit hole of what we might think is distinctly human, um, maybe games, or may maybe not human, but distinctly with relation to things that are alive, because animals play games. Um, so DeepMind's uh, algorithm or model was able to beat the world champion in Go, one of the hardest um, tabletop games in human history, was able to beat it three times, beat that person three times out of three times. Um, and if you're like me, if you maybe play a little more StarCraft than you play Go, um, you might also be interested to know that it often was able to beat uh, some of the best StarCraft, StarCraft players in the world as well. So now that we've seen sort of the panoply, I think, of where AI has permeated society. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the history. So the, you know, the history is one that shares features with the development of other technologies and scientific movements that have exhibited extraordinary promise to better human life, like human space flight or nuclear fusion. Um, and, and some of those things that it shares is that it has endured a long and rocky road to limited, limited success um, relative to the hype that's been given uh, to it. So to review the history of AI, you know, we, can, we can mark the beginning of computing potentially with Lovelace and Babbage in the 19th century. And then I'd like to jump pretty quickly to Turing whose work in the development of computing theory contributed to the fight against 20th century fascism um, and then led to the tests that were named for him um, to describe what is humanness uh, in robots. Um, so that was in 1936 and it was only, you know, it was fewer than 10 years later 
um, that McCulloch and Pitts developed the first neuron um, as a computational element. And then came a few interesting, uh, a few interesting years, about a decade and a half. There was a Dartmouth conference at which uh, several computer scientists got together and said, you know what, uh, give us three months and we'll, we'll knock this whole AI thing out of the park. We'll figure out how to replace, we'll engage these expert systems uh, in a way to, um, to surpass what, what humans can, can do. So three months later, they still had not succeeded, but they had run up the hype game quite a bit. And then uh, in 1973, Lighthill came around and said, um, look, y'all promised a lot and you did not deliver. Uh, and this is what led to, as I'll describe in a few minutes, the uh, one of the first AI winters. Um, then coming back, uh, Fukushima in 1980 created the neocognitron, which was building off the McCulloch and Pitts neuron. And this was a new computational element um, that was able to uh, recognize, I think, non-linearities. Jan LeCun, who is considered one of the modern um, sort of uh, maybe, you know, founders or the, one of the pushers of the, the third wave of AI was able to use the Fukushima neocognitron to uh, create a neural network that could be trained with, um, with enough data. It's small, uh, albeit. And then jumping ahead to, uh, to 2012, the, this is actually the beginning of the third wave of AI, um, where this competition called ImageNet, where people write algorithms to try to classify natural images, robots, dogs, planes, trains, automobiles, um, try to do that faster than, you know, try, to, try, to, try to do it faster or better than humans. And in 2012 is when convolutional neural networks was used for the first time and it kind of blew everything out of the water. Um, and then as I mentioned, AlphaGo um, came around in 2017. Uh, so this has been the progression of AI over the last few decades or half, you know, half the last 60 or 70 years. Um, and uh, what I want to punctuate are the two AI winters that we've seen, which were partially caused by overhype. Um, they, there were technical issues that had to be solved, and at the time, we weren't ready to solve them. So the architectures that people were putting together in the 70s weren't general enough to learn anything interesting. Um, and then, but, and then still for the second AI winter, um, the algorithms could maybe learn things, but they weren't efficient to really train, uh, in enough time. And so what's different about today, uh, well, now we have Zach Galifianakis working on our algorithms for us, but, uh, you know, he and others have developed efficient function optimization so that we can, um, actually optimize all of these weights in these neural networks, which are, you know, uh, anywhere from a few to a few million, um, and, and greater. Uh, we also have things called GPUs now that can do the computing fast enough. And then finally, for supervised learning in particular, we have enough data, so thousands of examples per object, um, in order to train these objects. Okay, just checking on my time. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about the history and where we are, um, I, I want to get back to the maybe the definition, which we have not actually, we haven't talked about. Um, and, it, and it's kind of problematic because we have all these terms flying around um, and, in, and in a few seconds, I wanna, I wanna propose sort of a different way to look at it a little bit. Um, it's not exactly a different way, it's just a, it's a way to describe, I think, how a lot of people are looking at it in a concise way. Um, but we have the, we have this idea of AI, which is, you know, it can, it can acquire knowledge bases um, machine learning sort of fits inside that where it does a few more specific things. Representation learning is then inside machine learning where it learns to, it learns representations of more, more abstract representations of the data that, that are being provided. And then deep learning is one of the uh, modern examples of, uh, of doing that representation learning. So I guess the way that I try to think about it is, you know, I, I was saying this last night when I was thinking about uh, um, I was watching Hamilton again. And um, anyway, there's a model, like everything is just a model and it depends on how you treat the parameters. And in, in the case of developing and fitting and optimizing a, uh, an AI model, it happens to be, I think that it's driven primarily by the data um, as opposed to being based on physical principles from the get-go. 
So that's how I choose to think about it at the moment, that, it, that AI is really a class of algorithms um, to build models that are driven primarily by the data. And I put a question mark there on intelligence because um, uh, Francois Chalette, who now works at Google, he, he helped develop Keras um, before it was acquired by Google and TensorFlow. He came out with a paper, it's a 60, 70 page uh, tome, really interesting, a few months ago, where he questions our approach to um, thinking about intelligence. Because right now, you know, we have the Turing test. So let's ask a robot questions to see how human it is, where we haven't even fully or clearly defined what our intelligence is. So why are we considering that the benchmark? It, it really just using doing that just provides a moving metric that we may never achieve, um, and rightly so, because there, it's not well defined. So he proposed some, um, some tasks or some pathways to developing appropriate metrics uh, for intelligence and for artificial intelligence. So how do these things actually work? Um, and I wanna start with um, reminding us that whenever you're developing a model, you are, you're in some sense training it, you're optimizing it, much as we have been trained uh, to not fall asleep in class. Well, it took me a little while. Um, but uh, so learning is about training, at least when we're talking about supervised learning. Um, so there happens to be learning that happens, and we, we call it learning um, in artificial intelligence because we use all these terms that are, that are still fuzzy. Um, but yes, it's optimizing, it's fitting, fitting the model to a data, to, to some data. So what is model building? Let's, let's, let's see if we can look at the spectrum of what models are from ones that we have more traditionally developed in physical sciences to the ones that are sitting inside AI. So let there be a model, uh, let's call it Y, that is a function of X and P, uh, where Y and X are variables and F is some function and P are some parameters. And if you wanna pay attention because the P is what will change from uh, story to story. And we're, say we're just fitting a line to the data. Um, in physics, we often come up with physical parameters that we have some sense, that we have some physical intuition for to put in that model. So let's say that A and B are those physical parameters. And then we, we typically they're few, they're as few as possible. And then we, we fit the data to that. In machine learning, uh, we are trying to optimize features P, uh, bias and slope that may or may not have, they often do, um, in machine learning at least, they most often do have some physical meaning already, but we are less prescriptive of how that optimization takes place. Then finally in deep learning, uh, the, this is more in the representation learning space, P, these parameters, these weight parameters, typically have no physical interpretation. We, we do not yet know uh, as a field how to interpret these physically in most cases. Um, so this is what I see. This is not the, my favorite metaphor, but it's the best one I've been able to come up with so far, this, this spectrum of how to think about what the parameters and features P uh, mean for models. And when, it, when we think about it like this, I think this removes a little bit of the mystery of what artificial intelligence is, at least in a deep learning context. Um, so these are, these are not these magical boxes that can do anything. They are models that we need to optimize. So let's, let's dig in just a little bit to see what, this, what the most sort of modern representation of AI is, this neural network object. As I said earlier, it's this input X uh, is some input data. The model G uh, is, the neural, is the whole neural network itself. And then there's a prediction why, for in this case, uh, for kittas and doggos, which one is which. So if you put in a cat, is it, it's gonna give you a probability of what a cat is, of, of whether it's a cat or not. And when we say deep, it just means how many layers of these neural net, of these, of these uh, neurons do you have? And that's what the circles are. These, are. these are those computational neurons that evolve from McCulloch and Pitts to the neocognitron to the various kinds of neurons that we see today. So this is, this is, this, is a, this is one example of a neural network, a fully connected model where all of the uh, information from one node in one layer goes to all of the, all of the nodes in the next. Um, and you can expand on this a little bit in, in sort of simple schematic ways to imagine what a convolutional neural network looks like, uh, which would operate on images. So in each of these, 
little circles here, this is where a lot of interesting stuff happens. Uh, this is where, um, well, a, in, I guess it's actually in the edge and in the neuron, in, in those two components, that's where the, uh, the weight of information that is being moved around is, uh, is placed. And then the nonlinearity that is applied to those weights is, is, uh, is taken at the intersection or at the, the edge between the arrow and the circle. And that computation is what, that nonlinear computation is what allows these, um, especially in often massive neural networks, to create a large, very flexible nonlinear model. And as I said before, these are like other models that we, we create that are less AI -y in that this, this red circle here, this red uh, loop is the guess and check loop. So there is some loss function or some cost to getting, to getting the guess of whether it's a kit or a doggo wrong. And so that loss and every loop looking at all the images is fed backward to update the weights in the network until you get the best network that you can based on the data you have. And so in a slide, this is, I think this is describing how we, what a, what a neural network is basically designed with and how we generate uh, a final model that can be used in some context. To get a little bit at the importance of the representation learning, I wanna point out this schematic example where we're trying to identify what kind of car the thing is. What typically happens in neural networks is that you have the initial input phase where the, the image of the car is coming in and then after the network has learned so much, um, it gets to the point where in the early layers, it's picking out a particular kind of representation or feature. So what you see here in these blocks above are these edges. So it's, it's, it's seeing these edge features that are, that are likely to be typical of this Audi. And as you move deeper into the network, you're seeing things that are more complex representations. So some circles, some combinations of circles with squares, and then finally get to the end of the network and it's and then the, the representation is outiness, which is more general than the edges or the circles. Um, so now that we've seen, I think I, hopefully I've, I've at least pose an interesting and useful way to think about neural networks and then a little bit about how they are, um, how they're designed to be general and how they're designed to be effective for lots of kinds of data. Um, and we've seen earlier how versatile they are as, as, as if, you, if you think about them as these, these, these objects or these things that learn primarily from the data, we've seen examples from all across society and in our daily lives. Now let's look at what would happen if we tried to apply these things to astronomy, which people have been doing for the last four or five years in earnest. And I'm, I'm going to broadly classify the efforts that have been undertaken um, into sort of three categories that I think are particularly useful in terms of astronomy and science experiments. And so first, uh, Almost hands down, I, my, one of my, I, think, I think my opinion is hands down, if we didn't develop neural networks any further, it has already been useful in classifying objects. It does things, and there are still issues, which I'll get to in a few minutes, um, but it does things so much faster as a filter that happens before the human looks at the data or even in tandem with the humans looking at data. And this has been valuable and I think will continue to be valuable in a lot of ways. You can also, uh, measure objects. You can measure the brightness of the galaxies or the stars. Um, a lot of great examples have been put forth with strong gravitational lensing. Um, lots of other images can be not only classified but measured uh, very quickly. Two items that I will come back to in a minute are issues related to bias and issues related to uh, uncertainty estimates for, for both classification and measurement, which are significant challenges. And then in simulations, end body simulations, image simulations, these can take incredible amounts of time, especially if you want to move between uh, different kinds of uh, systematics, different kinds of universes. Uh, to create a lot of these is very difficult and time consuming. And AI, for example, generative adversarial networks um, and related 
uh, models like Gaussian processes have been used to speed some of these things up. Just getting started in some spaces um, is the idea of using things like reinforcement learning, which is used to train robots, to schedule surveys of telescopes. So you're seeing here is a time-lapse video I took uh, at Dark Energy Camera in Saratololo, I think probably five, at least five or six years ago. Um, and this is, our telescopes are already largely automated, but the planning of the surveys when there are um, such plethora of competing observational needs in multi-purpose surveys can be uh, extremely challenging. So reinforcement learning is one thing that people have been looking into. This is an old graph, but I think it shows, and if you've been looking at the archive, I think you can couple that data with what you see here. And there has been a significant rise in the application of AI algorithms to astronomy data. And there is a lot of profit to be considered here, but I think there is also some peril that we should think about. Um, there is, a, I think, in physics and astronomy in particular, there is a unique intersection um, of opportunity for AI and physics. One of the strengths of using physics models to study AI um, and AI to study physics, sort of going, um, going in both directions for each other, is that physics models are often developed based on fundamental, um, fundamental theories. And so we, we develop understanding of those models in an exquisite way. And when we apply neural networks to it, that can potentially help us understand, for example, how neural networks work much better. The challenges. Um, something that when, when you, when we, if we think about neural networks in particular um, as panacea for some of our issues, it can be easy to overlook a few key issues that we face when actually applying them in rigorous scientific contexts. When we train neural networks, we need some labeled data and it can be really difficult to acquire that labeled data if, um, if you have to analyze the data first uh, with some other method besides, um, besides AI. And that or human, uh, human labeling can be very costly. So we often use simulations that we, we know exactly what we put into it so what we should get out of it. That is often used to train neural networks and other kinds of machine learning algorithms. However, applying those train, models trained on that data to observational data almost necessarily misses the difference between those two data sets. And this will almost necessarily incur biases that have to be accounted for. Um, so the, the, the difference between the training domain and the target domain poses a challenge for uh, removing bias from our simulations. Maybe worse, or maybe more concerning, at least for me, is that there is no currently known natural method for propagating error through neural networks. There is no, uh, there's no fully physically interpretable model of deriving uncertainty estimates from a neural network. So lots of things can be used to approximate them, but it's still an open field of research to understand how you get an error that you can understand, um, at least in terms of what we physically, we typically think about, which are say systematic and statistical error coming out of a neural network. Um, and part of this has to do with the large space of weights and lack of interpretability, physical interpretability of the weights that are in the neural network. And so it's hard to integrate over all of those weights or sample that entire space to, uh, to appreciate these in a fully Bayesian way. Nevertheless, we need to get there in some way. If we are con to continue using neural networks as we, would, as we potentially would like to, we do need to get to the space where we are, um, where we are appreciating that, we, that Bayes theorem and, uh, and statistical rigor is necessary for these models. One, one thing that some people have been looking into recently is simulation-based inference, sometimes referred to as likelihood-free inference, um, um, as, a, as a way to uh, achieve good estimates of posteriors. And, um, and in this case, you would be using neural networks to help, uh, to help create data summaries in an efficient way. So, you know, I, I just kind of, 
hopefully I, I clarified at least what some of my significant concerns are for using AI with physics in particular. Uh, so you might say, Brian, I thought you liked neural networks. Why are you dissing them? Um, also, I like not only what they've shown that they potentially can do, but I think what they've, what, for me, what they personally have represented is an opportunity to think bigger, to imagine more about what the future of science might look like. Um, so I, they, the future of AI may not be in the current models um, and designs that we see today. It may not be in neural networks. Um, but I think thinking about AI and seeing that it can potentially accelerate our computations, accelerate our modeling, accelerate our survey design, um, maybe that gives us an opportunity to imagine a different way to do science. And so with, with that, like what questions can we ask? So, so one, you know, should we use these things? And, and, I've, and I've started to address that given the concerns. Um, could AI even help decide which questions to ask? Could it help with hypothesis generation? How will algorithms be designed alongside hardware? So co-design, for example, TPUs, neuromorphic programming, FPGAs. Um, then, uh, then there are other questions like, can, what happens to scientists' jobs? As will we, will we stop needing humans to label things? Um, will we need less, in some cases, less effort to develop bespoke physically motivated algorithms? Maybe, maybe not. How do we integrate these algorithms with known physical principles, perhaps as a constraint? And finally, can it be unsupervised or less or much less supervised so it needs much less data or so that it learns or self-supervised so that it learns from itself? So these are the questions that I think about when I think about the entire experimental loop of you know, both cosmology and, uh, and physics, but also other sciences. So I think this is the break point um, that we can do for the five minute questions if that works for people. Yeah, that works. We're just going to have a short intermission and we'll take one uh, question from the Zoom Q&A and then we'll do one question from the Slack channel and then Brian will continue with the rest of the talk. So we do have one question that came in from the Zoom Q&A. You mentioned the difficulty in creating training sets. What do you see as the benefits and drawbacks of classification via citizen science or similar crowdsource data sets? Oh, this is a fantastic question. Um, and I really appreciate how it's been approached by the Zooniverse community, which is where I'm, I'm mostly aware of that, that effort. Uh, so I, I think since we don't understand the human mind and how it works, that is clearly a machine that we should continue to leverage for some of this. And um, since using its ability to identify patterns in a way that cannot be mimicked by modern AI, um, I think what Zooniverse has shown, I think it was a 2018 paper that if you mix, and I don't know if, I don't remember if they use neural networks or not, but if you, if you use both machine learning and humans, then you do better than neither uh, or than, than one or the other independently. Um, so I think until we have a better understanding, I don't know if we need a fuller understanding of how the mind works, but until we find some other way to get labeled data, it seems that citizen scientists and humans will be necessary to create some of it. Cool. Thank you. Let's go to Rand Paul for one question from the Slack. Yeah, there's lots of questions. So I'm just going to go with the first one to be fair. Uh, why should we call it artificial intelligence even when we are just using simple machine learning methods? Is the least squares method an artificial intelligence method? Uh, where is intelligence in least squares? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I, I tried to get at this in some of the earlier slides where we had the uh, concentric circles and then the idea of the, the models progressing from physically intuited to without physics. Um, you know, least squares, the intelligence in least squares, if you're using physical parameters is in the human because we selected the features and the parameters that we wanted, that we wanted to use in that model. I think that there is a significant problem with the nomenclature around artificial intelligence, partially because we haven't defined it well yet, and partially um, because we haven't defined intelligence well yet, but partially because all these other methods live at the intersection of multiple fields. And so it's hard to define what all these things mean. I think that that picture from the 
uh, deep learning book that I showed earlier, I think that is one of the best, that's, that's what I've seen as one of the clearest ways to try to give some order to the definitions. Uh, people have called um, linear, have called uh, regression machine learning or AI because, because these definitions I think are really not good. So I, I tried to, let me, let me make this a little more concise of an answer. If, you're, if you created the parameters yourself, let's not call it AI. If you don't know what the parameters mean physically, then maybe it's closer to AI um, in, in the way that it's used in the community. Excellent, thanks. So I think from here, we'll have you proceed to the, the second shorter um, part of your talk, and then we'll take more questions again at the end. Cool, Can yeah. you, uh, would you be able to tell me how much time I have left nominally? Yes, we have 18 minutes left total um, okay. in the rest of the session. So, okay. um, so whatever I don't, whatever I just, whenever I stop talking, that's how much time we have for questions. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. Um, so as I said before, I'm not so concerned about our robot overlords, but I am concerned about how we live alongside robots uh, or, or the things that are inside their computational um, membranes. So just to remind you, we went over lots of lots of boons for society that we've seen in terms of AI, but you know, in science, uh, in convenience with Alexas and beating video games and translating language. But there are also significant perils uh, on the other side of this. Facial recognition is in increasingly widespread use. So there are provinces in China where you can be texted a fine because there are enough CCTV camera CCT, CCTV cameras to facially recognize you um, as you jaywalk. In some schools, uh, they've adopted facial recognition to um, check for truancy. Uh, and then it's also being used in airports. To be fair, um, well not to be fair, but the other, other data here is that some cities are pushing back against this. So San Francisco has, an, um, has enacted a facial recognition ban. And there are lots of communities who are working to uh, augment that ban and make it more widespread. The company uh, Clearview AI, uh, which I think erupted early this year, the news erupted early this year, that they broke the terms of service for the social media giants, scraped as much data as they could, and created a, uh, a I think, I, my guess is that it's a semi-supervised algorithm like an autoencoder that can um, be used to input some image, say from, I don't know, an Amazon Ring camera that's sitting outside your house can be put into this algorithm and then it can cluster a bunch of images from social media around that image and try to identify who you are. When there's training done for these, uh, for facial recognition, lots of, uh, some of the data sets, at least this one, I think from 2017 or 2018, one of the standard benchmark training sets, the labeled faces in the wild, uh, is, is, used as, is used as a training set either for testing, um, for testing models or for developing them. And uh, you know, I, when I look at this picture, I can tell you that I don't see a lot of black and brown faces in it. And we talked about bias earlier in that if you try to go from one domain to another, you may do more poorly in the target domain. When you don't think about bias appropriately with these algorithms, you get things like uh, incorrect estimates of recidivism for uh, people in the criminal justice system. So there is an algorithm that's been in use to give an opinion or give a, give a number to judges in, in, in court who can say, uh, okay, I'm gonna take that number and I'm, then I'm gonna make a decision about whether this person should uh, get bail or not. And because of the bias in the algorithm, people who were not, who actually were not likely to, uh, to commit a crime or violate their bail were thrown in jail much sooner, and these, these were then black and brown people. We talked about the simulations earlier where you're trying to guess if an AI simulated which picture, and we saw that there was that little issue with the, uh, with the errant leaves up in the upper left. So if, you, if you're fooled by that, do you think that you would be fooled by deep fakes that are trying to generate fake images, fake faces with fake audio? Um, if you thought Photoshop was bad, uh, look out for the coming years and months with deep fakes. 
AI is driving automation in retail and other spaces. Amazon Go stores um, mostly eliminate cashiers and a lot of staff, but not all staff at these places. And it seems the trend is catching on, for example, at 7-Eleven and other retailers. And of course, we can't forget about, you know, if we're, if we're creating, if we're doing self-driving cars, if we're doing uh, self-driving delivery devices, self-driving drones, then why not self-driving weapons? Currently, it is only people agreeing that you wouldn't use the, you wouldn't use a, a AI based weapon to automatically uh, harm a person, but that's just an agreement. You can, there probably one line of code to say, make the choice based on the probability um, to fire, to fire the weapon. Um, so, you know, these, these tools are, it's important to develop them for science, but the societal applications I think are also very clear. They're dangerous for human lives in individual and societal contexts, medicine, self-driving cars, facial recognition, automated weapons. Um, and for many of the same technical reasons that it's, that it's dangerous for science, just statistical rigor, bias, error bars, et cetera. So, but let, let's even ask the question, like what if we solved all those problems? Do you imagine that there's a space where you would be willing to give up your agency for making these critical decisions that involve human lives? I, are you, am I, are you comfortable with deploying that power across societal contexts, even if it is done perfectly? And I think our institutions and even our, you know, ourselves, we often think about more what the boons are that we provide to society than the dangers that we enable. We don't typically talk about the negative outcomes that we contribute to. You know, we, we don't do, uh, we don't write a lot of papers that have null results. When we develop these algorithms in the name of science, but know they contribute directly to other people's lives to, and in often cases to add oppressive oppression to structures, I, I don't think that we get to say that we, that we don't contribute to that. I don't think that we get to say that we don't also bear responsibility. So while the, you know, the advent of AI has been incredibly disruptive and in some positive ways, it, it also has a potential to go in, in other ways uh, completely. Um, and it already is starting in that direction. And I, so I don't like to think about is, is your AI objectively fair? Can we remove bias? Because it's not clear to me that that's possible. So I think the better question is not does not can we make AI objective, but do we use it, do we allow power to continue to accumulate in the hands and minds of those who already have it when they're using AI? Or do we use this tool, do we use this disruptive moment to shift power to people who have not had it before, but still bear the weight of living with it in the hands of others? So I, I want to, and I, th I think there is, there's an important connection here to how we think about ourselves as, as a community and how, how scientific communities think about themselves. As I said earlier, you know, who, gets to, who gets to know how to use AI? So these choices extend not just to science applications, but who gets to learn about them and use them and who we welcome into our communities. For too long, physics and astronomy, in many cases worse than other physical sciences, has been, have been exclusive to black people and other people of color. And so I asked earlier who gets, you know, who gets to make decisions and, and I'll ask again, who gets to make the discoveries about the universe? Who gets to be in the dome where it happens? So most of our institutions, I think, up to now, you know, we've been telling them that there are issues, that there are problems. And by abdicating their responsibility for decades, I think they've also abdicated their mandate as the sole leaders and managers of a new era of change. I think it's time for modalities of truly shared leadership and decision making. I think we, and we're not going to derive change from the lowest common denominator in terms of creativity, in terms of empathy and compassion. We're not gonna be able to create inclusive, inclusive and just research spaces if we wait for those who are opposed to those to agree with us. I don't think the point is for everyone to agree and by awaiting for the universe to provide some objective solution. I think the point is we need to make a choice about what we want to be as a community. 
So some of us have been working to redesign, uh, I won't say just some, many of us have been working to redesign collaborative research spaces from the ground up. I mean, I've, I've been really fortunate to um, benefit from funding from LSSTC Enabling Science. Um, I've been hopefully been able to provide a conduit for new kind, for, for early career scientists to encounter or at least experiment with new kinds of research spaces that are more compassionate and more um, more inclusive. So I, one of those I think is the Deep Skies community. Um, we work at the intersection of AI and Astro and we prioritize equitable access and we prioritize uh, compassionate um, community building. You can find us there at those, uh, those links at Deep Skies Lab and, um, and deepskieslab.ai or .com. I think the influx of AI represents a significant moment of both technological and social disruption which the sciences are not immune to. Um, I don't think we can ignore that. It reminds us how to imagine a new future for scientific communities, just as we can imagine a new way of doing science, a new way of producing knowledge and discovery. These, I think, I think it reminds us that it's worth taking a step back and asking, should we? And if we should, then how? Um, so the oppressive structures in our system, for example, white supremacy and misogyny are the rivers that flow around us. And I think it's time for our scientific communities to take action from students and, pro and professors to provosts and funding agencies. Are we going to flow with the river or are we going to stand up and change the flow of it? So I think, you know, and, and you can ask how, and I, and I think a lot of people have been figuring out how to do this. How do we use this disruptive moment to make choices? How do we engage this opportunity? There's a, there's a simple, somewhat pithy answer, but from which I think we can derive a lot of meaning uh, or a lot of impetus, which is, I think we engage the same creativity and drive with which we pursue the mysteries of the universe. So we've been spending generations pursuing the ideas of Einstein and Hubble, and only recently raising the voices of Rubin and Roman. And I think it's time to turn our telescopes to the dreams of Martin and Nikki and Malcolm and Audrey. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brian. Uh, let's do a round of applause for Brian in the Slack. I see it's happening already, it's great. And we definitely have time for some questions. So the first question from the Zoom Q&A. So I saw um, some questions about training sets in both the Zoom Q&A and Slack. So I'm gonna kind of combine them together. So um, the one that came in from the Zoom Q&A about training sets um, is if you're using this methodology like AI in observing celestial bodies, wouldn't it be difficult when a comet or other celestial body comes in, which is not present in the training sets when it enters the, the frame. And from Slack, um, a question about whether there is a current state of the art in measuring how close your training set is to your target set. So general questions about training sets. And then I thought you might want to connect that to um, how we can change the training sets that are already in our own minds. For example, grad application committees, when you're looking at applications, and you, oh, this looks like a, a graduate student to me because of the training set that, that's in my mind. Um, so yes, training sets, generally. Training sets, OK. Uh, diatribe incoming. Um, so I, maybe I'll start with the question of do we, how do we know, I think what I heard is how do we know the distance between say the, the training set and the target set? Um, actually, I'm gonna move my window so I can look at you and look at the camera there. Um, this has been something I've, want, I've been wondering. I, I haven't seen this approached in even sort of a simple physical context, like say take, take a toy model and do some training and see if you add a, some kind of noise or add some kind of, um, uh, systematic. Is there a way to quantify that distance in in a simple way that can then be that can then be built on to um, for for more complex additions of features? I don't think I've seen that in a physics context. I and I I haven't kept up with the non-physics AI literature as much, uh, so I have, but I haven't seen it there either. 
I think that that's a worthwhile question to ask. And I think that's that also gets at that sort of intersection between uh, the, the, the value of, you know, the, the complementarity of AI models and physics, physics domain, because we can be very precise about those distances. So I think that would be a really fun project to do, is to tackle that. Um, specifically with respect to the, um, the comet issue, I mean, I think that we're gonna have to think about this when, if we keep allowing Elon Musk to throw up satellites, if we, if we allow Bezos to do that, I mean, I think that we, yeah, I think, I think that we do, do need to, I, I, think, I think we want to think about the algorithms, but I think we also may want to think about collective action to potentially prevent that or stop it. Um, I think I would, use, I would potentially be using similar tools to some of the other things that I mentioned. Um, you know, if you, if you had a comet coming in and you would, so, okay. So I think the way to think about it in, in a, a sort of quick way is consider it two different instantiations of the universe. And so you, you'd need to be making a training set that had it, had it with and without that comet, essentially. That's the way I'd be thinking about it. Um, with respect to, for example, admissions or for how we think about, uh, building communities that are quote unquote, or building communities with people that are quote unquote the right fit. Um, I, I think that is a, I wonder if that is more, I wonder if that's a deeper and more fraught topic than I'm exactly ready for, except to say that I, I don't see a future that where, where science is not oppressive when we are not using our own biased neural networks to make these to make these significant decisions, I think we need to we need to wipe wipe the slate clean, look at what was used before, and see if we need to add it back in to to how we build communities. But we, we need to ask different questions than what we asked before. We need to ask questions that prioritize people's health, that prioritize people's own sense of agency and success, not how do we get the next paper? How do we get the next grant? That all makes sense, thank you. Let's go to Rand Paul for some, pull some questions out of the Slack discussion. Yes, um, I'm having to use upvotes now in order to uh, see which questions to ask. So with respect to your history description and also these questions about the use of AI in physics, can you comment about the experiences of the scientists for breaking through AI deserts or coming up with how to use AI to ask questions, uh, trying to get back at the ideas of how we do science and who gets to do it? Is this, can, uh, could I read this? Is this where, um, there, was a, there was a bit there for me. I'll send it to you in the, in the Zoom. Ah, okay. Is that okay? I don't know if I can see the chat. In the Zoom. Oh, maybe I can. Let's see. I maybe if you just stop screen sharing, I think you might be able to see what I just sent you. I think the last thing I have from you is it'll be interim question time in 10 minutes. Okay. Would it work in the Slack or let me do it? Do you have it now? Ah, yes, thank you. The scientists for breaking through AI, yeah, right. So so breaking through those those moments, those deserts. Um, Oh, that is a tough question. Um, coming up with how to use AI, that question. I, so maybe I can think about this and try to post something later in the Slack about it, because I think this is an important question, but I don't think I have the best answer. Um, the, uh, maybe a quick answer is, I think that I have, 
I've enjoyed studying AI more when I think about what it fundamentally is as these models and not trying to use it as a black box that can give me a quick measurement. Um, I, I've, I, at first, when I, when I was doing some early strong lensing work and some early galaxy cluster work, my, I, was, I was really focused on let's build the best classifier, the best, um, best regressor. And then I started thinking about what's, 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 in, what's inside these things and how do they work. And I feel like that, is, that may be more profitable than a pure application. Okay, even though we see that there's lots of other questions in the Slack that, um, Brian, you'll have your work cut out for you to go through that later and see, <laughs> and see all of those, I think. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks again for being here and for Thank giving you. this talk um, today and being with us. And I'm just gonna close out with a couple of announcements and reminders, which is that we start sessions again at 1030 Pacific, that you can find all the Zoom links and everything in the website. And um, yeah, continue the discussion on Slack and remember to ask to uh, reach out on the help channel in Slack if you have any questions. So thanks everyone, I hope you have a great rest of your day.